Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Facebook Live, Clean Machine Live. <laughs> My name is Jeff Palmer. I'm your host, and I am the CEO and founder of Clean Machine, an all-natural, plant-based fitness nutrition company. So this video is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So we're going to be looking at a really cool new study. Sorry about last week. Uh, we recorded uh, the video and, of course, as many of some of you found out that um, uh, the video didn't actually have any sound to it. So <laughs> I'm redoing that video so you don't miss out anything. So hope you're hearing it live. Um, if you can hear it, just give me a thumbs up in the comment box. To make sure I don't, uh, uh, or a yes, or I can hear you, or something like that, uh, in the comment section so I can see that, and uh, we can move on forward. Okay, so this one is called uh, Early Hominid Human Brain Growth. Okay. Uh, recent oral microbiome research reveals the true paleo diet. So this is interesting because, you know, when people sit and find out I'm vegan, uh, the first defenses that they put up is, well, our ancestors ate meat. And by and large, some of that is true, actually. But like many starving animals, they'll eat almost anything they can just to get enough calories and to keep them alive in the short term. Now, long term, they're going to be preferably uh, inclined to eat things that make them feel better, uh, promote their health, promote longevity, uh, because all life wants to keep living. That's that's his foundational goal. And we eat to survive, but also to thrive, because the most thriving of the population generally passes on their genetics to the next generation. So. When you say, but our ancestors eat meat, the bigger question is, yes, but how much? Now, that question has been unanswered because we don't have any of these ancestors still around, really. Uh, ancient humans have evolved and changed over time, and all of the rest of those people that lived 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 years ago are dead. So how can we find out what it was that they actually ate? Well, the first clue we got about about what ancient uh, human beings early human beings um uh in a pre-industrial pre-agricultural field came from this one i'm going to put it up on the screen show it right here for you so it's caprolites capro meaning poop and uh lights meaning fossilized so this is what we were looking at <laughs> they look at fossilized human poop yeah, you can actually find these little balls of poop that got fossilized. <laughs> so they are records of what those pre-agricultural uh, uh, human beings, modern Homo sapiens sapiens, even back then, were eating. Okay, so what was in that poop? <laughs> well, let's take a look. So the caprolite research fossilized human poop, reveals that prehistoric populations relied heavily on plants in their diet for over 10,000 years. Now, how do we know this? Well, we know this because of this. Oh, it's kind of cut off a little bit, but I'll read it out to you. So that they took fossilized poop from all these different continents. In Africa, they found the fossilized poop had about 120 grams of fiber per day on the estimate. In North America, 150 to 225 grams of fiber per day. In South America, 100 grams plus. Australia, over 100 grams. Now, modern Americans are eating 10 to 15 grams of fiber a day. So on average, these pre-agricultural humans, homo sapiens, that were early ancestors of our modern humans, were eating 10 times as much and up to 20 times as much plant foods as we are eating right now on average. Now, I consume about 100 to 150 grams of fiber, and my diet is plant pure. It's exclusively plants. 
So this is telling us that, yes, even though they may have scavenged for meat, usually by another carnivore making a kill, and the carnivore finished its full and left and left some meat on the bones, and they went over and tried to pick it up and eat it. Now, this was not really a good idea because meat spoils and attracts parasites and, and, and worms and things like this that were not prepared to do it. A carnivore's digestive tract is really high acid. They have uh, digestive, strong protein digestive enzymes in their mouth. We do not. They have really high acid in their stomach to kill this bacteria that's on the rotting carcass. We do not. Herbivores don't have this. So we would get poisoned by this. So it was not a great idea for early human beings. But hey, if you're starving, you'll eat probably pretty much anything. So this shows us that on average in every single continent, Africa, Australia, North America, Europe, all over the world, they were eating 100 plus grams of fiber per day. Now, if you're eating that much plant food, 10 to 20 times as much plant food as, as modern Americans are doing, you don't have room in your stomach for a lot of meat. So there's no way they could have been this top carnivore type species that we were looking at. It's just impossible. You couldn't fit that type of meat in there. And remember, this was on average over 10,000 year period of our early ancestors were eating this way on average. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the next one. Okay, so the... <laughs> Now, the fiber was actually uh, producing some calories for them. And you're like, hey, wait a minute. I've heard fiber is not digestible in human beings. And that's actually not true. Yes, human beings ourselves don't digest the fiber, but our microbiome does specifically in the colon. It's called colonic fermentation. So this is the role of short chain fatty acids and in the interplay in between uh, the diet, the gut microbiota, those are our microbiome, the host energy metabolism. So this study shows that on average, modern humans eating a, a fiber diet, the fermentation of the fiber converts that into short chain fatty acids. Now the short chain fatty acids help support our immune system, help support tissue growth help, help a lot of wonderful things, help uh, ameliorate uh, damage to tissues and stuff like this. They're anti-inflammatory, so it helps with uh, inflammation. Butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid, also very strong function for our immune system, produce cathelicidins, which kills uh, bacteria and parasites and viruses. So those eating a high fiber diet have a better chance of surviving a viral uh, uh, impact too as well. So it showed on average that fiber fermentation is responsible for about 10% of the total human caloric requirements. That means we're getting 10% of our energy from these short chain fatty acids that is formed from our microbiota's digestion of fiber into short chain fatty acids. And then our body is turning those fatty acids, just like any other fats, into calories that it can burn and use for energy. So with this two, 100 to 200 grams of fiber, remember this 10% of the human caloric requirements by fermentation of fiber in our colon by our microbiota is happening all the time. And that's with us only eating 10 grams to 15 grams of fiber. Imagine if we're eating 10 times that, 100 grams of fiber, like this modern American is doing on a daily basis. We're getting a lot more uh, readily available calories. We're boosting our immune system better. Now, boosting the immune system would have been a very important part of survival for early, Amer uh, early uh, hominids too as well. Okay, so let's look at the next study. So, all right, but that was poop. <laughs> that was hu human or humanoid uh, hominid poop. And that include Neanderthals, which are not direct descendants of humans, and uh, the early prehistoric modern man, Homo sapiens sapiens. Okay, so this study came out because this was really unique. The, the other previous studies were looking at fossilized human poop, which is what we were pooping out of our body. This study actually found a way to find out what early humans were actually putting in their mouth. 
Now, this is really cool. This study right here, it's called the Evolution and Changing Ecology of the African Hominid Oral Microbiome. Now, how could they find out what was the oral microbiome, the bacteria or microbiome bacteria that was going on in our mouth? How could they see that if, on a fossil? Well, interestingly enough, when those bacteria are prominent in our mouth and they die, they actually get picked up and stuck in plaque. Yes, early human beings, even 100,000 years ago, the Neanderthals that were there, living 100,000 years ago, got these bacteria stuck in the plaque. And now DNA synthesis and analysis can show that by scraping off the plaque off of these jaw bones that they find of early hominids, including Homo sapiens sapiens, early Cro-Magnon man, early Homo sapiens versus basically modern man in very early prehistoric times, and Neanderthals both had this plaque of oral bacteria in there. So we know what they were eating by the, uh, the type of bacteria that was in the mouth. So if you eat a high protein diet, you're gonna have protein eating bacteria in your mouth. And that would have been the dominant DNA registered in the plaque of their teeth. How fascinating. But what they found was this. This is the actual Harvard publication that wrote about this story. It's a great read, short read. So I strongly suggest you guys read it because it's fascinating. So the findings on Neanderthal oral microbiomes offer new clues on evolution and health. Okay, so why is this so important? One, I know it says Neanderthals, don't get alarmed by that. They actually compared Neanderthals in this case to the oral microbiomes of modern humans and they were almost identical. All right, so they both, they found the basically the both thing in Homo sapiens sapiens as well as, as the Neanderthal species all about 100,000 years ago. So 100,000 years ago, true paleo humans, what were they eating? What type of bacteria did they have? They had starch eating bacteria predominantly. So let's go ahead and put this up on the screen. So they wrote the benefits of bringing the foods into their diet likely helped pave the way for the expansion of the human brain because the glucose in starch is the brain's main fuel source. Now, this is so important. Because the evolution, even, even modern humans back then, 10, 50, 100,000 years ago, those humans had smaller brains. How did our brains get big? Well, our brain takes up a lot of glucose. Actually, about 20 to 25% of all of the glucose that you consume through all the foods, fats, carbs, fiber, all of that glucose, 25%, one-fourth of all the glucose calories that you eat go to feed your brain. Your brain is one big glucose hog. It's because it's firing constantly. It's using glucose for energy production constantly. Even when you're sleeping, you're dreaming. So you're using your brain. Your brain is functioning to run your breath and your heart rate all the time. So it is constantly firing. So it uses more glucose than any other tissue in the body. Um, by space, by weight. Okay, so they wrote, the Harvard study wrote, we think we're seeing evidence of really ancient behavior that might have been part of encephalization. This is the enlargement or the growth of the brain to have greater capacity because you can't have a bigger brain if you're not giving it enough food, enough glucose. So the Encephalization is the growth of the human brain, Harvard professor Christina uh, Warner, PhD, um, proclaimed. So this is how we got to the big brains that we have. And, uh, we may or may not be using them very well, but modern brains got to be this big size. Well, this is really cool. But why starch? Why did they have so much starch? Because they were consuming so much starch. Why starch? All right. Now, this is where it gets interesting because starch is the highest in glucose. 
there's about 300 to 1,000 units of glucose in starch. So when you're consuming starch, you're getting compact, concentrated forms of it that the body can use as it's needed, peel it off and use it. So starch in tubers, in nuts, in grains, in beans, in starchy vegetables, these starches were the best sources of uh, to feed the brain all of that glucose that it needs to allow it to grow, to get bigger in size. Because you can't have a bigger machinery if you don't have a fuel source in a bountiful way. Now, it was interesting that they said, let's see. Researchers said the findings make sense because for a hunter-gatherer, actually probably a gatherer-hunter, societies around the world, starch-rich foods, roots, tubers like potatoes and herbs, as well as nuts and seeds, for example, are important and reliable nutrition sources. In fact, starch currently makes up 60% of all the calories humans eat worldwide. We're still basically starchivores. We are still dominantly starch eating humans. That's so we can feed these big old brains that we got. <laughs> That's just amazing. And what it says is that, okay, we're talking about Neanderthals. The new data makes very sense to me, says the researcher, reinforcing the newer view about Neanderthals, that their diets were more homo sapien-like, more modern human-like than once thought, meaning a starch-rich and cooked diet. So even Neanderthals 100 years ago were cooking mostly barley and roots and tubers and starchy vegetables to get the nutrition that they ate. So now we know, based on this oral microbiome, right, fossilized in their jaw bones, in the plaque on their teeth, we know exactly what they were putting in their mouth, mostly starches. This is what allowed this evolution of our increased size of brain and what allows it uh, to go on continuously. Um, uh, this is a, an interesting comment from the researchers. The findings also push back on the idea that Neanderthals were top carnivores, given that the brain requires glucose as a nutrient source. And catch this, Meat alone is not a sufficient source. Uh, meat doesn't basically have hardly any glucose in it at all, unless you're getting a little bit of the glucose that is stored as glycogen in the tissues. So not enough glucose to supply a brain this size. Now, what makes that really unique <laughs> is this study on glucose. So this study is called Glucose Requirements for the Development uh, developing human brain. The human brain is highly reliant on glucose for few fuel and growth. An adult human being at rest consumes approximately 20 to 25 percent of its resting total body glucose consumption. This is nearly double that required by the nearest evolutionary cousin, the chimpanzee. This brain is soaking up and using two times as much glucose as our closest relative in the animal kingdom, the chimpanzee, the bonobo chimp. Two times as much. So there was no way we could have been basic uh, meat eaters. It just would not supply enough glucose for our brain to function and our brain to grow double the size of our close, closest primate relatives. So this is huge. <laughs> so how much glucose are we actually using? Well, the average male brain, it's different from male to female, brain, the male brain uses a little bit more, and I'm not gonna get into that, but the male brain uses about 80 milligrams of glucose per minute for energy and growth. And you know, when I talk, hear people talk about a paleo diet limiting carbohydrates in their diet, I'm like, that's the total opposite of what the paleo diet really was. And it's basically starving your brain of what it needs most, glucose. So 80 milligrams of glucose per minute is what your brain is soaking up, a whopping 
115,000 milligrams of glucose per day. <laughs> that is phenomenal. In comparison, the brain uses about three milligrams of DHA per day. Now, everybody's talking about, oh, you need, you know, uh, mega-3 DHA for your brain to, to survive and for your brain health and to have a healthy brain. Bullocks, <laughs> oh my God, it's garbage. Our body stores up to 50 grams of DHA and we only use three little milligrams. That's 50,000 milligrams of DHA stored in the adult human body at any given time and we use three of them. 50,000 stored, we use three per day for our brain. And we think, you know, gotta have fish oil to feed the brain. No, you gotta have glucose, 115,000 milligrams of glucose, three milligrams of DHA. Which do you think is the most important part for <laughs> human brain development, human brain function? It's not the omega-3s, it's the glucose, it's the starches, it's the carbohydrates, all right. So some people say, but oh, we shouldn't be eating sugar. You shouldn't be eating white sugar, all right? So let's, let's take a look at that. All right, so this is a picture of how all of the macronutrients that we consume every day are made. So the plant takes sunlight and forms glucose out of carbon dioxide in the air and water that it absorbs from the soil along with other nutrients that it absorbs from the soil and nitrogen from the air or the soil. Okay, so there are four basic molecules that build everything. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then nitrogen for proteins. So everything starts out as a glucose molecule in plants. That's why you see that big circle in the middle of this leaf as glucose. Glucose makes cellulose or fiber. Glucose then turns and adds nitrogen and turns into amino acids and protein. Glucose forms longer chains of glucose to make starches and fats. And glucose makes simpler forms like uh, simple and complex carbohydrates. It makes vitamins and minerals. Carb CHO, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are the glucose molecule. That is what it is. And just adding bigger and bigger chains of this makes it go from carbs to fats to sugars to starches to even amino acids and protein. So everything is based off of glucose. Fat, sugar, salt, not salt, sorry. Fat, starches, carbohydrates, proteins, and fiber all start out as glucose. And when we consume them, we can break them all back down into glucose. Our body can take fats, carbohydrates, and proteins, and even fibers, and break them down into simpler and simpler forms, and eventually into glucose. So all things start out in the plant kingdom as glucose, and all things can be broken down in the human body back into glucose. Yes, even proteins can be broken down into glucose. Everything starts out as glucose, everything can be broken down in glucose. Why is that? Because the human brain, the brain function is so dependent on glucose, we want to make sure that we have adapted to the most abundant original source of nutrition, which is glucose. Glucose makes everything almost in the nutritional aspects, and it all starts out. Remember, Animals don't make nutrition, they consume nutrition. Animals actually just eat the nutrients or bring them into our body. Plants are producers. They actually create all the vitamins, create all the um, macronutrients, fiber, carbs, fat, protein. Animals don't make any of those things. Uh, they don't make fiber. Uh, they don't make proteins, essential amino acids. You can take apart proteins by eating them and put them back together and form new proteins. Yes, but that's just like playing blocks as a child. The child didn't create the blocks. The plants create the amino acids, the essential amino acids that are consumed by this. So this is the process. <laughs> Glucose is the thing. Now, Scientists and food experts have figured this out and just said, well, why don't we just take the glucose out of the plant 
and make it simple glucose, and it'll fire up our brain. Well, this much is true, but it'll also fire up inflammation. That's why white sugar is not good for you. I'm not suggesting everybody go out and eat a bunch of isolated glucose. No, nature has it nicely packaged with fiber, with water, with polyphenols that regulate how that glucose gets absorbed and utilized to maintain a healthy blood glu glucose level and sugar, eat them in the whole foods. That's where the, the plants have made these and packaged them with antioxidants and all these things. The polyphenols actually help us metabolize and utilize these in the proper way. Once you remove that glucose, it doesn't have all of those different extra effects to it. The fiber to slow the digestion, the uh, polyphenols and phytonutrients in there that actually help regulate the control the, of the sugar. So that's what the original uh, paleo diet was. So if you say you're going on a paleo diet, start munching some fiber, folks, because they were eating a lot more plants than modern Americans today. The average modern American is eating 10 to 15 grams of fiber a day when our ancient ancestors for over 10,000 years were eating a high complex carbohydrate and starch rich diet. That is what allowed our human brains to get to the size and intelligence level it is now. And that's how we can continue to feed our brain exactly what it needs. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I. It's great to have the research that comes through that really tells us. Before, we were just looking at, hey, there's some bones, animal bones around the uh, uh, fireplace that we found that were ancient uh, Neanderthals or, or early Cro-Magnon, early... Uh, uh, homo, sapiens, homo sapiens sapiens. So they must have been eating meat. So they we had tools and spears, so they must have been killing animals. And we just made this assumption that we're going around killing all these animals and that's what we were eating. And now we know that's just absolutely false. Yes, they may have used spears on an occasion to actually kill an animal and, and use those tools, but that was not the mainstay of what we were eating. We can tell by what they were pooping out and we can tell by the microbiome fossilized on their teeth exactly what they were eating, digesting and getting rid of. It was plant foods. Now we know that, let's stop using this as an excuse that that's the way we've always eaten. It is not. And now we should be smart enough to know, hey, I'm not starving. I don't need to go over to a carcass and risk dying from food poisoning. Remember, salmonella comes from dead birds, right? Chicken. Chicken is the number one source of salmonella poisoning in the world. And back then, they had to eat most everything raw because, or they, they did finally learn to cook it because that killed some of the salmonella. But look, we don't have to risk that. We don't have to do that anymore. We don't, we aren't starving for calories. We aren't starving to death. So we have the choice now to walk into a grocery store and pick something that doesn't harm our body, doesn't harm the animals, and doesn't harm the environment. And right now, it is more important for us with nearly closing in on 10 billion people, we must change to a more civil diet, a more enlightened diet, much more like our ancestors ate. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you can turn in uh, on other weeks. I'll continue to bring the information that blows the doors off. All these false ideas, false assumptions. Look, there's nothing wrong with getting it wrong. It's the best knowledge that we had. We made assumptions based on the research that was available. But as this new research comes out and paints a different picture, let's listen. Let's absorb this. Let's actually use this to benefit what we do in life, the choices we make for our diet, for our health, for our planet, and for the animals that we share this planet with. Thanks for joining me. I'll be back again next week with another great Clean Machine Live.